further. So, uh, thank you, Rui. Uh, good morning to all the participants, and uh, like you told, welcome to the third and last day of the AED Days uh, 2020. I'm Pedro Castro from Aerotest Plus, and uh, I have the honor to be your moderator in this workshop, COVID-19 Impact on Aerospace Supply Chain, Perspectives for the Future. Uh, very important to see the future in the actual uh, context. So just a few words, this session will be divided in two main parts. The first, individual presentations in English. In those, uh, I will present each speaker and uh, a second part that will be a Q&A session, maybe with some discussion, in which uh, I will ask some, some questions, and I also pick up some questions from the audience. So please keep your time in order to have some, some time to, to, to some questions. I'm, I'm totally sure that it will be a, a very interesting discussion in a micro level, but uh, also in a particular, in an inside scope, of the, the Portugal context. The impact of this pandemic is absolutely gigantic. We all know, uh, using an adequate metaphor, before COVID, the AST sector was completely in the sky. And now, after COVID, uh, we are in the underground, in hell. Uh, some people uh, say me a few days ago, 10 years for nothing. After a decade of insolent growth, historic increases in production rates and thousands of jobs created. The COVID-19 has plunged the aeronautical industry into the worst crisis since the Second World War. The figures are staggering. In six months, the crisis have eliminated the equivalent of 10 years of job creation in the sector. And that's the hard reality. So it's the actual photography. I, I now it's time to pass to the stars of this session. Our four speakers. Uh, thank you all for your availability and interest to participate and share with us your expertise. I'm going to pass the word to the first star, Luigi Scatea, partner at PwC. Hello, Luigi. Can you make the kickoff, please. Absolutely. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, for inviting me in this panel. Um, so today I will be presenting uh, the Aerospace Manufacturing Attractiveness Index uh, study that PwC releases uh, periodically. So the, the 2020 edition. And in this instance, I'm uh, replacing uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Scott Thompson the uh, head of aerospace and defense uh, uh, in our US uh, uh, office. So I have to say, just for, uh, for the sake of introducing myself, that I'm um, within PwC and uh, within the aerospace and defense uh, global practice, I'm in charge of space. So I'm not a full expert on the aviation um, vertical, let's say, um, the commercial aviation vertical, but I'll do my best to convey the main messages uh, um, prepared by my colleague Scott which, by the way, sends his um, apologies for not being here. It was an issue of, uh, let's say, uh, time, uh, uh, an issue of timing, uh, since basically uh, uh, in the US uh, right now, it's like uh, the middle of the night. Um, so just to introduce the, the, the study and to echo what has been uh, just mentioned, um, until the COVID-19 crisis uh, actually happened this year, Commercial aviation was uh, was a booming sector. So we had uh, basically growth at double the GDP growth uh, for the past decade with uh, revenue records in, uh, in 2019. So clearly and consistently, the emphasis uh, for the last two decades uh, for the commercial aviation has been on, uh, on expanding. And now, with the crisis, the emphasis has uh, shifted more to um, ensuring liquidity and risking the supply chain. Uh, with all plannings uh, are uh, with, with all the plannings oriented for a return to volume in uh, in a three to five years uh, window at the moment. Um, so, if we look at the impact of uh, the global on uh, of aviation on uh, GDP and global employment before COVID, we can basically see that it was uh, gigantic. 
So we had uh, a basic impact on, uh, on the tourism, so what we will call a catalytic impact, so the enabled revenues in tourism thanks to commercial aviation. We had uh, uh, GDP impact induced and indirect, which were uh, uh, quite, uh, quite massive. So the induced impact will be the um, uh, GDP impact on spending, uh, due to the spending of all the people working in aviation and in the aviation supply chain. Um, we have an, an indirect uh, GDP impact, uh, indeed uh, quite massive, so this will be the impact due to the spending of all the suppliers in the aviation uh, um, supply chain. And uh, even the direct GDP impact is quite big. So for the direct, this will be the gross value added generated directly by, uh, by the commercial aviation industry. Um, all of this, uh, of course, has been uh, clearly completely disrupted this year. I don't have figures here on uh, on the actual uh, loss uh, of uh, GDP because it's uh, it's a little bit uh, um, too soon to extrapolate also the induced and indirect impact. It's an analysis that we are doing and we will uh, release that at the end of the year probably. Uh, but the good news is that uh, uh, of course uh, we um, uh, we we assume that COVID-19 will end and the growth at some point will resume. And then uh, we will have again uh, like an increase in the in the aviation sector at one point. Uh, the global middle class has uh, been expanding, and it's uh, and actually the expansion of the global middle class has been a major driver of uh, growth for the aviation sector. And in the next decade, uh, the middle class is projected to increase from 25% to 60%. So this means 2.6 billion potential new travelers uh, for uh, for the aviation sector. When we look at the, uh, the aerospace and defense supply chain, it's clear that uh, we are talking about uh, a complex and long cycle supply chain um, with uh, uh, you know, the manufacturing capacity that has taken uh, decades to be built. So this uh, supply chain needs to be kept agile in order to, to be able to, uh, to fully rebound. So there is a need for industry stakeholders uh, to grasp that uh, uh, you know, for, with, with the disruption of this scale, they must be um, more innovative and rethink the way uh, they organize the, the, the supply chain and overall their business. So the Global Aerospace Manufacturing Attractiveness Index uh, is uh, basically an analysis that PwC carries out periodically, looking at uh, different uh, uh, countries around the world and ranking their attractiveness uh, for uh, aerospace manufacturing by looking at the number of different uh, indicators. So the indicators are uh, listed here. So it's cost, labor, infrastructure, industry, geopolitical risk, economy, and tax policy. So I'm, I don't want to spend too much time uh, uh, describing in details uh, each of these because they are quite uh, uh, self-explanatory, uh, by the way. But just to say that within each of these, we have had uh, several countries, I mean, some countries ranking, uh, of course, better than others. So, for example, from the point of view of cost, which actually looks at the overall uh, costs of setting up shop and producing and manufacturing, Australia and Finland have ranked best by showing uh, very good results in uh, productivity and electricity price. Uh, the UAE has uh, uh, moved up uh, quite significantly. On the labor, uh, we have Canada and the Philippines uh, um, ranking very well, uh, thanks to the availability of uh, highly educated labor forces. Um, on the infrastructure, we have Japan and South Korea uh, at the top spot, uh, thanks uh, to the high quality of transportation infrastructures and uh, um, uh, reliable water supply. In the industry, the, the United States uh, rank first thanks to, uh, to having an aerospace uh, industry with a, which the largest uh, global sales and, uh, and overall consumption. On the geopolitical risk, we have Germany and Japan first and second, with, uh, um, from this point of view, being the less uh, risky uh, country to do uh, business this year. On the economy, uh, when we look at uh, the, the, the factors like increase the FDI and the GDP. We have China on the first uh, spot, 
with uh, Vietnam and Thailand uh, second and third due to their uh, low unemployment rate. While on tax policy, we have uh, uh, countries like Bahrain, Hong Kong, and Qatar uh, ranked uh, in, the first, uh, in the first spot. So this is basically the, the ranking as it shows uh, overall uh, based on a uh, combination of all the indicators. And uh, <clears throat> in this ranking, Portugal uh, has uh, um, a position of uh, 31st. Um, which is, uh, uh, in the end, not that uh, it, it, we are skipping, like between Hong Kong and Portugal, we are skipping uh, all the, the countries in between. So the position 31st sounds not very high, but in fact, it's not that different from uh, some other uh, uh, countries in Europe, like France and Italy, for example. Um, so overall, uh, if we have to analyze uh, why Portugal ended in that uh, specific position, so giving uh, like a little bit more in-depth analysis on Portugal. We have to say that uh, uh, the, the main, um, um, like uh, the main uh, factors driving this, uh, this index position are the industry rank of 62, due to challenges with market size, uh, profit margin and maturity and the labor ranking of 47, which is basically driven by the, the labor force sides and the education rates. On the other hand, uh, uh, Portugal has an infrastructure rank of 24. So uh, this is mostly due to uh, uh, average, uh, lower than average internet usage. And uh, um, a strong rank, th there is a typo there because I think the infrastructure rank is not 20. Yes, it's uh, and uh, a strong ranking of 24 for uh, infrastructure which is supported by uh, scores in, uh, in roads and quality of air infrastructure, for example. So now what can uh, uh, Portugal do to, to build up its position? So these are uh, some of the analyses that are also in the, in the full report accompanying the analysis. Um, so Portugal should address the small percentage of high-tech export uh, by continuing to improve uh, the R&D environment. So a lot of... Uh, um, Good efforts have been made in this uh, in this field, uh, in the overall aerospace and defense uh, uh, sector in Portugal. So this uh, should uh, should continue. Um, there should be probably some uh, uh, regulatory changes uh, uh, to uh, uh, improve the competitive environment, particularly around the transport sector. Uh, synergies should be uh, uh, looked for uh, with companies in the transportation sector that at the moment represent 25% of exports for Portugal. And so uh, partnerships uh, should be pursued in order to improve energy efficiency uh, since uh, transport in Portugal represents 42% of, uh, of energy consumption. Then there should be uh, support on high-tech upskilling and reskilling programs uh, to uh, to increase uh, uh, the, the knowledge base and, uh, and uh, the skill set creation in the local talent base. So if we look at more broadly, uh, some of the, the measures that, uh, that are suggested, you know, for uh, uh, countries worldwide, but in, I mean, of course, this applies to Portugal as well. It's invest in the industry of the future, in digital transformation, in supply chain evolution, and in the workforce of the future. So on the digital transformation, um, I think this is a lot of uh, uh, stuff that everybody in the audience is probably already aware of, but uh, data right now is the new oil. So um, uh, there should be always a strong push in extracting, extracting value from data. So uh, digital transformation is key at this point uh, in time, and as is the emphasis on smart factories uh, uh, that uh, leverage uh, uh, as much as possible the power of all the data that is produced within the, the, the production. So all of this, of course, has the objective to uh, reduce the design cycle time, increase visibility, in increase visibility, reduce lead times, and improve quality and performance, as well as enhance uh, productive, uh, pre predictive maintenance. On the supply chain, uh, so we know that the, the global supply chain is valued at around 700 uh, billion and uh, the global commercial MRO is predicted to grow. So it is important on, uh, from this perspective to actually 
pursue like exports as much as possible and gain a, a standing into this global supply chain. Um, at, at the same time, uh, right now, it's clear that the, uh, the aerospace and defense uh, supply chain lacks agility and visibility. Uh, it's highly fragmented and this contributes to challenge and it has also contributed to some of the, the, the current challenges uh, within the, the COVID crisis, of course. Um, so future investments uh, require uh, technology to reduce uh, uh, fragmentation and increase traceability and includes, of course, getting more skilled, trained uh, workers with digital skills. Um, so the future digital supply chain requires a digital workforce. So it's important to have a digital strategy uh, that is uh, clearly linked with the overall market strategy of, uh, um, of companies and of the industry if we take uh, in case uh, uh, the case of a uh, country perspective and it's also important to pursue the right change management because in the end uh, uh, we talk a lot about digital transformation but it's not easy to impose and uh, uh, pursue transformation uh, uh, with companies uh, because of course every change uh, implies anxiety and so it's important to manage the change in the right way so this is basically all for uh, for my presentation. So um, thank you very much uh, for your attention today. Thanks, Luigi, uh, for this complete presentation. Let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Jean-Luc Fenou, Head of Supply Chain and Quality Watchtower at Airbus. Euh, bonjour Jean-Luc, euh, bienvenue. Euh, je vous donne la parole, mais en anglais, s'il vous plaît. Of course. Uh, just one moment to make sure that we have the presentation here in front of us. It is okay. So, so yes, okay. Uh, okay. So the... oui. ouais. Do you see the presentation? Not yet. No. no. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, good. You should see our screen, right? Correct. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Luc Fenou. Uh, thank you, Pedro, for the introduction. So, I am the head of the supply chain and quality uh, watchtower, which is, uh, I am working in procurement operations, so supply chain in, in Airbus. I've been there for now uh, eight years and more things in Airbus before. And uh, my organization is in charge of uh, anticipating uh, risk. So I will focus, uh, as the title of the presentation says, of uh, what we have been through in the past six months and uh, uh, what it was to manage uh, this crisis for, uh, for Airbus and what we can learn for, uh, for the future. Alors. So the, the, the phase one, the phase one of this crisis for us was uh, from roughly from February to April. And uh, although it seems like a, a long time ago, uh, you have to remember that it all started by uh, learning that uh, Wuhan uh, was closed. Uh, lockdown around the city of Wuhan and so we looked uh, we have uh, we have a view of our uh, supply chain and we looked at it and said okay uh, good for us uh, not that many plants in Wuhan we are we are not touched and then uh, it started to expand uh, slowly but surely and uh, then it was China then it was uh, Far East then it came to uh, to Europe and it uh, became uh, worldwide uh, so how to, how to manage that uh, we had to adapt. Initially, uh, what we did was uh, using our uh, knowledge of uh, the supply chain, of our supply chain, we were capable to identify uh, the areas in the areas that were uh, touched by the by the COVID, uh, which plants were there, what was the potential impact, which tier ones could be impacted, and so uh, we created the centrally the information, we distributed it to the teams and asking them, please contact uh, your, uh, your suppliers and make sure that we are uh, managing the, uh, the, they are managing the, the consequences. 
And then, it, you know, as, as more and more uh, area became uh, touched, it, it was not anymore possible to do that. It had no sense. Well, basically, all the supply chain was uh, pot potentially impacted. And therefore, we, we moved to the other way around. We said, OK, it's so big that we cannot give you the target where to look at. We need you to tell us where are the impact. So it was a big change that we had to do in something like a couple of weeks. It was that fast. And so what, what was the focus? But the focus was to, uh, to, to keep Airbus operating. Uh, we had, as you know, and uh, as you can imagine, we had our own uh, difficulties internally. But uh, to keep operating, we needed to have the, the flow of parts. So we needed to know which sites in uh, supplier sites were closed. Uh, at one point in time, we had in excess of 150 supplier sites closed around the world. And therefore, we looked at, uh, with the parts uh, which are in transit, uh, how, how long are we secured? And we were on a six weeks rolling horizon, making sure that we had stock or parts in transit. And, uh, and if not, uh, what could we do? And uh, trying to anticipate when uh, the supplier sites were going to, to reopen and would that uh, fulfill our operations. So that was first, first phase one. And then April to June, new, new problematic. Uh, back to work, uh, the, the lockdowns are progressively uh, removed and our suppliers are reopening. But obviously they are re reopening with the, the new constraints. Uh, today I am... Uh, <laughs> A perfect example of these new constraints. I am wearing a mask. Apologies for that, but I have my colleague Laerte in the room with me, and the rules, uh, the rules in France today, requires us to, to wear a mask at all times when we are at work. So, not a big constraint. Uh, and in the manufacturing environment, the constraints are uh, probably uh, much more severe. So, for us, uh, the, 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 the key uh, was to say, okay, our suppliers are reopening. That's good. Uh, but are they reopening in a good shape? Are they managing uh, the, the, the new difficulties? Uh, when you close a plant from Friday to Monday and it was not planned, uh, are the, is the work in progress uh, well identified? Are the machines maintained? Um, uh, one of the many new topics we had to check was what about the qualifications? Uh, if you had an audit planned for the next three months to maintain your qualification, your authorities cannot travel, how do you do? So these were the kind of things that we don't check on a regular basis and that uh, we, had to, uh, we had to create a checklist to, uh, to give to our teams to make sure that our suppliers were considering all these aspects and uh, reopening, I would say, in an orderly fashion. And the focus uh, changed from this uh, six weeks uh, horizon to a longer term and making sure that our, uh, that our revised needs, which were passed to our suppliers, again, Airbus, we had to, uh, to review our, uh, our planning, our demand, cascade it. And uh, so uh, the focus is, uh, was now to uh, make sure that our suppliers uh, did uh, understand the needs for Airbus, which are obviously different, huh? we, we reduce the rates like, like everyone, and uh, were they prepared to meet that and uh, managing uh, all the aspects necessary to meet uh, these revised needs in this uh, new and unusual environment. And this leads me to the, to the, to the phase three. So what we are seeing uh, today, uh, since June, but uh, even more uh, today, is that um, everybody is now taking the, the measure of uh, what this crisis means. And, and it means that uh, the, the, we have to take measure to, to uh, we, the, our supply base, have to take measure to ensure that they survive uh, this, uh, this pandemic and the crisis that we have today. So the, the biggest and uh, most impact, uh, most uh, obvious impact are uh, workforce reductions, so partial unemployment to start or layoffs, depending on where, where in the world you are. And now what we see is that they are revising their industrial footprint. So 
Industrial footprint change means transfer of work. Uh, transfer of work means big changes and means a huge risk of quality. The story tells us that even in, I would say, in a normal uh, period of time, a transfer of work is, is, uh, is, is the source, a potential source for, uh, for quality issues. And today, our customers, uh, our airline customers, as you can imagine, as they are not really needed uh, extra capacity, uh, they, uh, they are uh, extremely demanding in terms of quality of the, of the aircraft, and, and rightly so. They should be like that every time. So they are not overly demanding, but nevertheless, they are more demanding, and, and we need to ensure that our aircraft are top quality. So this wave of transfer of work uh, uh, which is which is big, which we see coming, uh, which is increasing, which is combined of both uh, measures, you know, transfer of work. Uh, there are transfer of work every time we, for competitivity, for uh, for increasing the rates before, etc. So a lot of them were already on the way. Uh, they uh, their schedule change due to the to the COVID crisis, and now we have new ones which are coming from this uh, necessary uh, readaptation. So all these. We need to anticipate to make sure that uh, we can manage from an airbus perspective because our approval is necessary in, in some cases, even if we are not driving the, the change. Uh, and we need to go and look forward uh, beyond these changes. We, uh, we are there to stay. Uh, our ambition is, uh, is to, uh, to emerge from this crisis stronger. Uh, they, we have a strong... Uh, aircraft portfolio, uh, there is a demand for our aircraft, there will be a demand for our aircraft, so we must collectively be ready uh, to emerge from this crisis. So ensuring business continuity is key. Uh, on this slide, I, I, I chose to highlight the, the fact on, on the skills, you know, laying off people uh, when you are taking uh, uh, measures uh, where you have uh, people that are uh, going for an early retirement. Uh, it's uh, highly skilled people, highly knowledgeable people which are living. So how do you make sure that you retain this knowledge so that when you are, uh, that when we will grow again, uh, we will be able to maintain the efficiency and the quality of our product. Well, business continuity uh, on, on skills is one example, but all the others are, are touch. Uh, many of our suppliers uh, are uh, in a, in a tight cash situation. And it's very important to make sure that we don't make inappropriate shortcuts. Uh, there are things where uh, we cannot simply uh, uh, make cuts and uh, there are things that needs to maintain from a quality perspective. And, and in conclusion, it's, uh, although it may not be easy to, uh, to, to, to get that, but we, what this, uh, what this um, crisis tells us is that uh, risk management is uh, is important, it's extremely important, and uh, we need to, to be even better at that. And uh, that's, that's what we do in Airbus. To give you a, a perspective from a supply chain risk management perspective, before the crisis, the, the, the review at a top management level, the, the pace was a, more or less a, a quarterly review, which, which looked like adequate at that time. Uh, now, uh, we are on a weekly basis. So, uh, because, because of, uh, of this situation. And uh, so we, we have taken these steps. Uh, we need to anticipate uh, and uh, we need to keep adapting to, uh, to what is uh, coming forward. That's it. Uh, I thought, I hope that it gave you a, a perspective of uh, how we managed uh, this, uh, this crisis, how we keep managing it. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for your attention. Thanks. Uh, merci, Jean-Luc, de votre présentation. Thank you. Um, now to our third speaker, uh, Matthew Duke, uh, Director of Supply Chain Operations at uh, Bell Flight. Uh, hello, Matthew. Uh, may hello, you take the role? May you take the role, please? Yes, uh, I will start sharing now. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone can uh, see the screen and uh, thankful to be able to address you uh, today and talk a little bit about a uh, Bell's new perspective or modified perspective on 
how we're evaluating our supply chain in a risk-based situation. So uh, obviously we've heard quite a bit today about uh, uh, engagement during the uh, pandemic and it's uh, very similar um, at Bell, how we've um, had to uh, modify and engage our supply base. But uh, in the mid and early years uh, of 2019, Bell decided to start taking a more um, holistic perspective to risk. Um, traditionally at Bell, uh, risk had been associated with capabilities, capacities, um, quality, uh, kind of the standard supply chain um, inputs as we assessed and evaluated our supply base. And so going into uh, the 2019 year, uh, we were projecting how we would sustain um, our fleet in, in a more comprehensive way and looking at how we would use our suppliers uh, in new and different ways. And so it was requiring us to take a new view of risk and a new view of opportunities with our supply base. Um, unfortunately, with the uh, onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to accelerate that quite a bit in how we were engaging and assessing different risk opportunities within um, our supply base, not only uh, nationally in the United States, but also globally um, as it has affected uh, every market that we are in. So trying to advance the slide real quick. So in, in doing this, what Bell uh, has taken the approach is we've created a, a command center of analytics uh, and evaluation for our supply base. The uh, original intent for this command center was to be able to um, access uh, flight data, um, not only for our commercial customers, but our military customers, and allow us to get a better visible uh, perspective of flight conditions, um, aircraft performance, and allow us to take proactive steps uh, to secure not only sustainment parts, but also services for our fleet. So what we were able to do is we took this same uh, perspective uh, at the early onset of COVID-19 and started applying the new risk parameters we were seeing. Now, part of these new risk parameters involved um, government regulations and government uh, rules about shutdown, about being able, economic performance, um, different things like that. Now, we, uh, we saw varied uh, reactions from not only national but local governments associated with uh, our suppliers and how we were going to be able to interact with them. Um, we do quite a bit of business uh, with European suppliers, with South American suppliers, uh, and the uh, reactions and uh, steps taken by each government system was actually quite different. And so being able to uh, take all of those inputs, put them in a central location, and then assign a risk value to that was something that was critical for us to be able to focus our efforts um, on those most important uh, suppliers or most impacted to maintain our uh, part flow and supply chain viability. And so within this command center, what we've done is we've actually gone out and uh, categorized risk. Um, we have it to the level of you know, local and city governments. Uh, we also have it to identify not only um, pandemic type situations, but also natural disasters. Uh, in the United States, we have quite a few um, wildfires going on in our Western coast um, that are impacting our suppliers. Um, our command center is set up to identify those situations so that we can proactively engage with those suppliers. And so all of this uh, data information that is gathered real time is sending actionable signals to our uh, procurement team to reach out to suppliers, uh, ensure their operational viability, and then assess how we can engage them to make sure that we are getting parts uh, not only for our production line, but also for um, our sustainment uh, spares organization to ensure that our fleets out in the uh, global economy are, are functioning and are able to stay uh, in flight uh, as much as possible. And so um, we are using this right now. Uh, each day, uh, obviously, 
the uh, wildfires and, and um, forest fires in uh, California, Washington area are a very um, significant point to us right now. And so that shows up um, on uh, what I'll show you next is essentially we get an output um, of a global perspective. All of those um, dots and those different colors are areas of supply chain influence for Bell. Um, obviously when they get more pink and red, we have instances where we have higher risk. Um, and that's allowing us to send resources there where possible uh, and maintain higher contact. Um, so the timeline at the top is essentially how Bell approached this um, from the beginning back in December. And what we did, um, unfortunately was more manual than we desired at the time. We are since automating, but we took a risk assessment of our international supply base based on not only government it, um, regulations, laws, but uh, also uh, raw material availabilities, um, unique parts, um, unique IP that allowed us to go and focus our efforts. So uh, essentially in the onset in those uh, January and February timeframes, um, our, supply, our supply base was being contacted on a weekly setting at the high risk level to ensure that they were not only operational, but they weren't uh, being impacted by the virus um, and they were being able to ship product. And so um, while we were able to contact, uh, you know, we have just under 1000 suppliers in our supply base right now, and we were reaching out to uh, about 50% of them once a week to ensure operational um, viability. And we were reaching out to all 887 that you see on the slide um, at least twice a week. Uh, again, a very manual effort, but a very proactive effort uh, you can see on the graph on the left, what we measure is material availability. Uh, material availability in our definition is being able to have parts uh, ready to support the production needs and the spare needs of our fleet. And so we were actually able to increase our material availability during this pandemic um, almost two and a half percent, which for us was vital in keeping our production lines going. Um, being able to deliver our customers, uh, not only military and commercial, but it's also set up for us to be able to maintain this level of performance, uh, which we have historically never had uh, ongoing as we are able to predict and analyze risk in a global economic, uh, environmental, and in a uh, government uh, impacting situation. And so, uh, the risk-based uh, expanded view that I talk about in our title is that we are taking into account many more factors, uh, many more factors that allow us to be proactive, that allow us to be more engaged and more understanding of our suppliers. Um, traditionally, uh, Bell has not had a very close or, or good contact with the local uh, governments and how they were playing a role in our suppliers' day-to-day -day activities, and now we're able to. Um, this allows us to be a better partner as we go forward and allows us to support not only our production, but our fleets in a much better situation. Um, the other thing it's allowing us to do as we look at our, our global impact is take these risks and identify where we need to have um, safety stock strategies, where we need to have uh, second and third source strategies, and where we need to be engaged um, with local governments to ensure that our suppliers are getting the, the focus and support that they need to support our operations and support our fleet around the world. So in doing this, um, you know, we started it in a very early time in 2019. Unexpectedly, we were able to turn this and use this as a proactive engagement tool for our supply base, which is critical in times like these so that we can use those risk assessments and evaluations at each area, at each supplier, so that we are engaged properly and that we are helping them to be able to sustain their production as well as our sustain ours. And so uh, we've seen this to be a very successful adventure um, and, and gained a lot of uh, partnerships and a lot of knowledge on how we are going to be able in the future to engage our global supply chain in a much more proactive and beneficial way for both Bell and the supply base. 
And I believe that's uh, that's all I have for uh, this uh, morning or afternoon. So uh, I'm I'm grateful to be able to share that perspective from Bell Supply Chain, and uh, uh, look forward to fielding any questions that uh, that you may have. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew, for Bell presentation. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, we are going to Samuel Farias business management at uh, Brazilian Aerospace Cluster. Oi, Samuel, seja bem-vindo a este painel. Queira, por favor, lançar a, a sua intervenção. O som, Samuel, por favor. Sorry. Agora sim. Uh, bom dia, Pedro. Bom dia, Rui. Good morning, Matthew and other city here. Uh, I, can I share my screen? Okay. You can see this, this is screen? It's okay now, somewhere. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, First of all, I'd like to, to mention, uh, I'm very glad and thankful for have uh, this opportunity here and talking to you guys and joining uh, this opportunity to talk about the resilience scenario and current uh, what we have uh, here and what we had in the, since in the beginning of the COVID-19. Uh, I'm Samuel Farias, uh, currently working in Brazilian airspace cluster in a business development role. This, this cluster is co-managing as program into Parque Tecnológico de São José dos Campos, states of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, the core mission of Brazilian aerospace cluster is fostering innovation into aerospace supply chain. So, uh, I would like to share with you the next one. It's, I'll talk to about uh, a little bit about, about impact to Brazilian supply chain of COVID-19. Uh, the opportunities to Brazilian aerospace cluster members that we had and the forecast of 2000. Samuel, Samuel, if it's possible to put in slide mode, please. Uh, slide mode. Okay, sorry. Now it's okay? Not yet. Now, okay. Here, good, good. Now it's, now it's okay? It's okay now? If you can just put uh, the slide so the, as you can see. Uh, you can see now, for me, my, 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 my screen, me, uh, I'm seeing the, the second one. Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yeah, okay. Okay. And so uh, the next slide you're seeing uh, in major, as I mentioned, in major, our members in Brazil in our space are tiers one, two, and three to embrace supply chain. Based on that, any action by OEM should deeply impact small and medium companies. Once concealing orders haven't happened in the first moment, but when embraer orders forecast was reviewed, brought to then the suppliers affecting economically region of San Jose Scopes and other regions as well. At this step, as closer, we've taken survey in two different scenarios after, after COVID-19 pandemics. First, as you can see in May, just after confirmation of lockdown, once it have stood and lasted by two months, we took the first glance in a survey to measure main impacts due to economic aspects of crisis, it was expect some actions as cut jobs, put labor force in, on hold and working from home. In a second glance, September, when in addition of crisis in place, we had a red information of shut down negotiations between Brer and Boeing. At this scenario, all impacted members described a deep impact as shown in the screen. The result of the bottom line 
components of cluster have cut jobs in neighborhood of 30% of previous work before COVID-19 pandemics. So, however, we shall have to have attention also in opportunities that come to front door due to the pandemics. Industrial reversed its efforts due to a new scenario. Brazilian companies engineering available, use engineering available, sorry, their technological training and capacity, knowledge and readiness in many initiatives to fight COVID-19 and brought here fact sections to deliver solutions. Here you can find a little bit of those projects and got actions taken in a very fast approach by Brazilian companies. Not all, just on the Brazilian, but also multinationals working in a, into, into Brazil in the clusters. Example, an UV sanitizer cupboard by Aditex. It works to, this, 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 this cupboard works to eliminate the coronavirus and other bacteria of many different surfaces and environments, just on air, as, aircrafts and hospitals, living rooms, etc. The next one is a brick by Hobotis. It's, a, it's an individual breath and bubble, mainly used to transfer in patients and reduce risks of intubation. It means uh, in, uh, reduce the invasive ventilation in the hospitals, in, uh, uh, in medical urgencies. Most part of this innovation projects was driven to solve medical issues and have been used to public crown control, example, as in campus of University ITA, Instituto Tecnológico de Aeronáutica, in San Jose Campus. Uh, this next one, OptoThermoScan, was used in ITA. It one is, was developed by Opto Acker Group for military use, but in, with the pandemic of new coronavirus, this equipment was adapted to be used as public health aid. It is an uh, equipment capable of monitoring the body temperature simultaneously of several individuals in a certain at a certain distance. There are here uh, many actions. There are other many actions and initiatives taken by other companies. But I, I just to mention and highlighted here some projects of innovations that brought companies business sustainability. Next one. So. We must keep our heads up on the forefront of crisis. Brazilian clusters, Brazilian clusters, sorry, is organized to manage and cooperate in projects, looking for better times ahead. Here are some of these programs. The first one, Apex program, the policy of attracting direct investment to their space supply chain, promoting companies, products, and business uh, show um, international aerospace missions as Paris Air Show, Feinberg, among, among others, and also macro intelligence and forecast given to the, the, the supplier's base, capacitation and qualification programs, for example, NETCAP accreditation. Uh, since 2018, we had uh, offered a NETCAP to our cluster members. This, this means full support in order to then achieve an adequate net cap accreditation. At this time, you have uh, the Boeing situation. So in Brazil, we had to, to perform that the suppliers perform better to, to attend also the supply chain uh, by uh, Boeing supply chain, different than, than Embraer. Embraer had the, the quality standards, high level quality standards, but Boeing preferred to net cap. And so we started to, to move forward on this direction. The support was compliance to OEM requirements, enhancing supply chain based in some categories. All core efforts in this program that were linked to training capabilities and orientation to companies hit their goals in the accreditation process. Okay, uh, next one is uh, a project linked to enhance the tier one players, the tier one uh, suppliers, uh, not to transform the tier two or three and cooperate together and to, to have integration as a tier one. Example is a consortium of, of suppliers that could integrate the system or structure complex into aircrafts. 
And so this one aims to add value to Brazilian in, in our aerospace industry in order to deliver integration of complex systems by the OEM. The next one, Mercado de Memoro, Mar Memoro Market. Uh, airlines need to protect their access at this time. And for example, change our craft from packs to cargo. Here uh, we have, we had the opportunity and a positive market share trend to Brazilian companies achieved. Not we have a market already, but the cluster should uh, impact more joining together this MRO as a vertical into the cluster. The next one is, uh, is, is just to, to, to okay. Uh, the national content, the national content it's a nationalization program of primary, primary part numbers and complex systems. It's strengthening the productive value chain using competitive quality management in aerospace industry in place in Brazil to enhance national content. And so the next one is very important too because we have a trend now, right now to support space economy. And so in, this, in this space, we can uh, opportunity to add value to, and the discussion around Brazilian access to global projects in, into space economy, both in upstream and downstream. We are very uh, high level, uh, high level skilled with some companies in upstream, but in downstream we have some lack of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, how can I say, of position. And so we have also an opportunity in uh, Brazilian Alcantara, base de Alcantara, Alcantara Lounge Base, uh, we, we as cluster, we can have very far our current industry to participate in such product. And last but not least, uh, we have the KC309. Comp uh, the companies and survey demonstrated such interest to an opportunity to then, uh, with increase of cadence of orders, of increased aircraft orders, pushing efforts from cluster to support entire supply chain. And so, uh, this kind uh, of our view to face new next generation to Brazilian space market. Muito agradecido, muito agradecido. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup. Uh, I, ha I have here some uh, next one slide is uh, also about some of our, of our companies. Uh, thank you very much. I think from my side from now is this. We got some well. Thank you very much for your words. And now we have a few minutes <coughs> uh, to have some questions and answers. Um, I'm going to start with the question uh, to Airbus. Uh, as in other industries in Airbus, uh, also planning to reshuffle the production of items back or closer to their final assembly lines, for example, in Europe. Um, not that I am aware. Uh, our suppliers are uh, long-term partners for us, and uh, therefore we. I, I would say that quite on the contrary, today the, the focus is to uh, help our supply base weather the crisis, and, um, and 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 stay as strong as possible. Airbus uh, has been engaged with uh, not myself but uh, colleagues in procurement into uh, you know uh, for example at, uh, at French and and, and, and greater European level uh, uh, identify the companies that need uh, you know facilitate the, the access to uh, financial support from uh, from the state and, and, and stuff like that uh, we don't plan to uh, to take uh, any any move that would uh, further weaken uh, our uh, our partners mm -hmm. and supply chain merci jean luc uh... Matthew, can you tell me if Bell have um, actually uh, is evaluating Portugal as a possible partner for the future supply chain? It means that can you uh, tell us if this crisis can be an opportunity to the chain reconsolidation in globing uh, the south of Europe? Uh, absolutely. And so, you know, as we are evaluating um, the uh, opportunities and where we have high risk, um, especially in our international aspects. Um, we are looking at um, countries that we have not traditionally been involved with, um, Portugal being one of those, uh, Morocco being another, 
um, and uh, several other entities on expanding some operations or our interfaces that we have with them. So as we are, are becoming more educated on uh, each country's uh, capabilities um, and offerings, um, we are able to, to kind of plug that into our risk categories and see where we can diminish and mitigate risk by going to other foreign countries that we are already closely working by um, to help uh, give us the, the optimal opportunity to support our production and our fleet users. So um, Portugal is, is absolutely part of our um, reviews and studies. Uh, again, it's one that traditionally Bell has not been um, heavily engaged with. And so we are, are taking the opportunity to learn and get ourselves educated so we can uh, engage properly. Okay. I don't know if, if Luigi, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm still here, sorry. Okay, uh, Luigi, uh, a simple question. Women, women resources, we know that human capital is, is, is completely important in this. Uh, do you think is with the crisis an opportunity or a weakness? Because in the, in the growing, we have problems to, to, to achieve to, to get uh, labor work. And now we have perhaps the problem to lose uh, some human capital. Uh, how do you think? Well, it's a complex, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, just, uh, I also have to, uh, to keep the mask on because I'm also based in France and I was uh, just <laughs> reprimanded in the office. Well, it's a complex question because of course it depends uh, on the specific uh, um, sectorial area that uh, we are looking at. But for sure, um, I would say that at this point in time, for a country that is looking to build capacity, like Portugal, um, this has to be seen as an opportunity more than a threat, for sure. Because you are seeing that there are uh, some uh, specific needs emerging, there are uh, uh, some uh, disruptions happening uh, within the aerospace and defense sector as a whole, in multiple ways. And uh, uh, a country with less uh, uh, stakes and less legacy, uh, let's say expertise and uh, uh, an anchors can surely, you know, take all of these as an opportunity to build in the right direction for the future. So I would totally think that um, right now uh, for Portugal, this, uh, this represents uh, uh, a good opportunity to invest in the right direction. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, we have other questions, but we are closing this session. Uh, in other opportunities, we can continue this discussion. Um, just to finish, I, I think the, the health of the aerospace industry is delicate and susceptible to, to the attacks of the global pandemics. The recovery of the sector is directly linked to the evolution of the cure and the disappearance of the virus. That's for me, it, it's clear, a step-by-step -step process of recovery and let's hope on this progressive recovery of the aerospace sector in our reconquests of the skies. From my point of view, this was an amazing session. I'm humbled to participate in this event. Thank you very much. Stay safe and see you soon. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.